Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate that. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 63. Psalm chapter number 63, we read a portion of uh, the entirety of the text, only 11 verses, but it's a wonderful psalm. It's a psalm that uh, J. Vernon McGee has called it an um, ointment for, the, for sores, also a band-aid uh, for, bu- for bruises. It's a psalm that the early church fathers would uh, sing uh, every uh, service that they had, and, and many times they would be something that they would uh, every morning uh, stand up and quote, uh, and we recognize that it's a psalm that's been, uh, through the years, used uh, in many cases to try to bring comfort uh, to, to people, but in, here in this particular psalm, we find uh, David is in the wilderness, and we often find that uh, it is in the wilderness where God will meet his own. Uh, sometimes uh, we do not like being out in the wilderness. We do not like going through things that would uh, put us in a situation that feel where we feel discomfort. But yet that's uh, the tool sometimes that God uses in our life to get our attention or to teach us principles if we have an open and in tune heart with Him. We do know that whether uh, in this particular uh, psalm, uh, we're not sure if this was a cave uh, of Engedi or Adullam, uh, each of which were in the Dead Sea area. If you know anything about the region in the summer, most of the year be a very hot uh, place to reside. The caves would be a little bit cooler in there, but it was a place that David would flee from King Saul. It was also a place uh, where he fled from his own son who was after him. And you think, well, King David, you know, he should have no problems in his life. He was anointed king. Everything should have just been easy for him. Uh, If you ever take time and read through David's life, there was much turmoil and many problems. Some of his own accord, he brought them on himself. Others were other uh, other situations that he came into where God obviously allowed, but others were after him. And we recognize that David had much trouble in his early years after he was anointed king. And we recognize that even though, though he saw great victories, we see many of the Psalms that David write, write uh, show us the ups and downs of his spiritual life. And Psalm 63 is really a wonderful psalm that does teach us to trust God even in the wilderness. And so uh, this morning I'd like to uh, preach to you coming out of verse number 5 actually, where it says, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. The title I've given this message is Being Satisfied in a Desert Place. Being Satisfied in a Desert Place. Let me just give you a little background before Psalm uh, Psalm 63. If you go back with me to actually chapter number 56, there are a series of psalms, five psalms that are mentioned in here. And uh, from 56 to 60, these five psalms are called miktam. Uh, psalms, and uh, not miktam psalms, but they're just given this title of miktam, which means uh, engraved. Uh, the scholars who study this seem to uh, indicate that these five psalms were something that David wanted to make sure that these were saved and preserved because it explained uh, truths that were important to him. And as I was going through these psalms, I uh, just noticed different principles Uh, from these different psalms, which I'll get into here in just a a few minutes. All this is just introduction to uh, Psalm chapter number 63. Uh, But notice that uh, in 56 and verse number 8, it says, Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. They are not, uh, are they not in thy book? Interesting that God not only counts and records what your life is like on a daily basis. This is something fascinating about our God. You as an individual, God every day takes into account what you do. That's an amazing thought. Here, David takes it a step further. Every tear that I have shed, you put it in a bottle. There was actually a custom back in uh, this time and, and it carried on through, through many d- years that uh, during this time the uh, people who mourned for a loved one, when they would cry tears, they would actually hold these little bottles up to their, their eye and they would cry into the bottle. Then they would take that bottle of tears to the grave and lay it at the tomb of their loved one. It was a sign of mourning to them. And it's kind of interesting that David uses that illustration 
uh, of God actually putting his tears in a bottle, saving it and, and understanding that when we go through difficult times, when we go through tough times in this life, God is recording and he is, if you would, keeping in a bottle our tears. Kind of fascinating when you think about it. Here we find David in the wilderness once again in, in chapter 63. And as in this wilderness, notice what it says here in verse number one. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul does what? Thirsteth for thee. And it goes on to say here, my flesh longeth for thee in a what? Dry and thirsty land where no water is. Here David is not only talking about his climate that he was actually in, a very dry and a desert place, but he's also talking spiritually or emotionally, mentally. How many of you have ever been to a place spiritually, emotionally, mentally where you just felt dried up and you just felt like you were just in a place of, of just uncertainty? And sure, many of us have been there, and you'll be there many more times in your life. You say, well, thanks for the encouragement, Pastor. Well, it's better that you have a reality check now than go through life saying, why does this keep happening to me? God has a meaning and an intention. Now, you may have some that you brought on to yourself. You can't blame God for those. But there may be others that God brings in your life for a purpose. And it's not a purpose to destroy you. It's a purpose to help build you and to give you confidence in God's watch care over you. But we resist that. We don't want that pressure. We don't want that dryness. We always want to be well-saturated. We always want to be filled with joy. We want to be happy all the time. And that's wonderful, but that's not reality. The reality is you will go through times of feeling like you're in the wilderness and there's nobody there. And that is a good place for us at times. That's where we learn the most about trusting God. That's where we learn the most about what we really believe about God is in those times of in the wilderness and just being away from uh, people and uh, being away from places. Uh, but sometimes we know this, we're in the midst of people. You could be in the midst of loved ones, people who care for you greatly. You could be in the midst of a great church and still feel like you're out in the wilderness all by yourself. Anyone ever felt that before? Sure. Even amongst family members and friends and coworkers and people that care about you, you can still feel like you're just in your own little world and you might be having your own little pity party. We recognize that God has a desire to help you to understand. And he uses David and David's many different situations of life. And David pens this wonderful psalm to help us, to console us, to give us some direction in our life. But we talk about being in a dry and thirsty land. There were a number of years ago, if I think back, it was probably about maybe 10 to 12 years ago. I went through a time of not being quite in shape, and I decided that I was going to take a bike ride, and so I took a bike ride from our house. It's downhill all the way, a couple miles, if you wanted to take for our house, take a left out of the driveway, it's downhill. I thought, well, this is a very pleasant thing. This is really nice. I'm enjoying this ride, and, you know, I had to hit the brakes a few times. It was going a little fast, but I like speed, so I push it a little bit, and wind all the way down to the river, the Mystic River, and uh, get down there. So a few miles of riding the bike around, enjoying that. Then it was time to return home. Well, if it was all downhill on the way there, it's all uphill on the way back. And at first, I was like, I could do this. And of course, I like challenges, and so I'm not going to just take it easy. And I've watched many people walk up our hill. I'm thinking, those sissies. There's a person walking their bike up the hill. They say, come on, you don't walk a bike up the hill. You ride the bike up the hill. I don't care if you have to put the lowest gear you make it up the hill unless you have a flat tire. And even then I might try it because I'm just going to push myself. And so I pushed myself. Remember, not having worked out for a while and not realizing how out of shape I actually was at the time. Well, I pushed it and I made it up my hill, all the way up my steep hill in my driveway, thinking, yes. And I got off the bike and I felt different. <laughs> it wasn't muscle fatigue yet. It was just different and lightheaded and just sweating profusely. And I'm thinking, something's not quite right. Now, I played sports all my life, worked out hard, done all kinds of crazy things. I'm thinking, but this is different. Went in the house. At first, I, laid on the, I think I laid on the deck for just a few minutes trying to get my whereabouts. And finally went in the house, went upstairs, went to the, take a shower. And I'm in the shower, I blacked out. I'm thinking okay, I'm still standing, but I can't see anything, and I'm not feeling quite right. And, and so I kept thinking, okay, Lord, is this it? What's happening here? You know, you go through the whole thing of, 
what's going on? And uh, so I got out of the shower, and after I got out of the shower, I actually turned the water to cool because I wanted to cool off more, and I'm sweating still profuse. I'm thinking, why am I still sweating? I just got out of a cold shower. And so as I was walking out of the bathroom, I had to stable myself a couple times, thinking, okay, this isn't good. So I laid down on the bed. As I laid down, I felt okay, and I'm thinking, all right, well, I kind of know what these effects are then. I was kind of figuring it out. And so I got up and I you know, went downstairs. My wife was preparing a meal and I said, um, honey, I'm not feeling quite right. Just watch me. And as soon as I sat down out on the deck and she was watching me, she said, oh my goodness, you are gray. And I was like, you're talking about my hair? I know my hair is going to, <laughs> no, you have no color. Like you are gray. And she just like, I'm calling 911. I said, whoa, 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 don't overreact here. I was like, and, but I could feel it. You ever felt just like the color was leaving your face? You could actually, it was like a line. I could just feel, it was like somebody with a laser beam on me. I could feel the heat and it just started going and going. I was like, okay, this feels really weird. I said, well, maybe you should call somebody. As I'm sitting there and now just the color is leaving my body, and I'm like, I'm not quite sure what this is now. And so anyways, I went to the hospital and they checked out and they said, you are severely dehydrated. And they said, when's the last time you had water? And my initial response was, I have water every day. I drink, I drink about a pot of coffee or two pots every day. <laughs> and they said, no, 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 no. When's the last time you had pure water? They're like, oh. And I know better. And I'm thinking back. I'm thinking, I have no idea when the last time I just drank water. And so they pumped in, I think, three or four bags of saline solution into me to get me back to the right place. And and so they let me go after a little while and, and said, drink water. I said, got it. I said, coffee? They said, no, water. I said, all right. <laughs> so anyways, I learned that you must have a certain amount of water in your body before you work out. And I've been good ever since then, just so you know. But that was one of those moments of real, reality and, and recognizing that water is good. But when you're in a place where there is no water, and that's... Here, I did not realize how bad it was for me to be without water. I was going through the motions. As long as I didn't overexert myself, I was doing okay. But as soon as I overexerted my body, where typically you can handle that, because I was not saturated with water, because my body was not properly hydrated, my body reacted. And we recognize that sometimes our body is thirsty even when we don't know. We should thirst after God spiritually all the time, and I think that's something we do, but we can also go through times where we're not really thirsting after God, and we're just kind of going on past experiences, past opportunities, past meetings with God, church services only, where we're not really letting God saturate us in His Word. We're not really spending time in the Spirit where we need to have God minister to us and to praise and honor Him. We're going based on many, many past experiences spiritually. And so I was functioning even though I was, in a, I was dried up inside. David thirsted for God in a dry and thirsty land. And it's interesting that God met many of his people in the wilderness. David, as we'll talk about here, for one, David was... Um, at a place where he was running away from trouble. And we find him in the wilderness. We have a man named Moses. Moses was a reluctant leader of only a couple million people. But he was a reluctant leader. And we find, where do we find Moses? In the wilderness. Elijah was a man who, after some great victories, because of the weariness of his own heart and the fear that this woman was going to kill him, we find him in the wilderness. Abraham was a man that we find in the wilderness having to learn to trust God and not his own self. Hagar, a woman abandoned, mistreated and abandoned, was in the wilderness when God met her. And we can go on and on with the illustration of the scriptures that many times God will find you when you're in the wilderness or you'll wake up and recognize, I'm in the wilderness. And the next question is, where's God? Where's God while I'm in the wilderness? He's right there. Sometimes he's waiting for you to look up so you can see him. Sometimes he's waiting for you to look in to realize how far you are from him. But he's there. He hasn't gone anywhere. If it's the same God that keeps every tear of yours in a bottle, it's the same God that will be there in your darkest hour. He knows 
what you're about. He knows your character. He knows your spirituality. And yet he loves you. That's an amazing thought. He loves you still, knowing everything about you. We recognize then that David was in the wilderness. And if you would, just again, just for a quick reference here, before I give you the, the three main points, in chapter 56, this is one of the five of the miktam. These, the word means engraved uh, psalms, which also uh, has the idea of being fixed. And David says in one of these psalms, my heart is fixed on thee, O God. But I want you to notice it in Psalm 56, uh, the, the uh, reference here that I'm making to this is that David uh, mentions here about oppression. Look at verse number one. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily does what? Oppresses me. So David understood what it was like to be oppressed by others. Anybody been in that wilderness of oppression where others have oppressed you? You've been through trials. It could be someone you live with. It could be extended families. It could be at the office. It could be a neighbor. It could be a brother and sister. There are times when we go through times of oppression, and David understood what oppression was like. Notice chapter 57, and I'll just kind of give you what I've studied on this. In chapter 57, David asked, uh, spoke of calamities that were befalling him. Calamities, great trials and great difficulties he was going through. He, he called them calamities. And I don't know about you, what you would equate as a calamity in your life. Chapter 58, he talks about the wickedness of other men and the wickedness of, of judges who are judging men unfairly. And he talks about their wickedness. It was another place in the wilderness Chapter number 59, he speaks of enemies and how he had many enemies who were out to kill him. And so he speaks of those who are against him. In chapter 60, he talks of questioning. Questioning. O oh God, thou hast cast us off. Thou hast scattered us. Thou hast been displeased. O oh, turn thyself to us again. He was questioning God in this chapter, if you take time to study it and read it. And we see this progression of David's thoughts. He goes from a place where he felt oppressed to calamities, to uh, being around wicked judges, to uh, just uh, questioning God. Chapter 61, he cries out, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. And then chapter 62, he talks about waiting on God, waiting on God. Truly my soul waiteth upon God for him from him cometh my what? Salvation, my deliverance. Deliverance is what he was waiting on God to deliver him. And now we come to chapter 63, and I want to give you three points from this chapter, three main points. I want you to see, first of all, in verses 1 and 2, David's passionate appeal to God. We're talking about being satisfied in a dry land. David understood what it was like to be in a dry place. He understood what it was like to be in a dry place spiritually, emotionally, mentally, even physically, being there. He understood what it was like to be in a desert place where, God, where are you? What are you doing? Why would you allow this in my life? Why are there so many wicked people against me? Why this and why that? Here, David, anointed king as a young boy, saw some great victories early on, but then had the king, the sitting king, wanting to kill him. But wait a minute, God, you anointed me king. Why are you allowing this to befall me? Some of us have had those questions. Wait a minute, God, I'm one of your children. I trusted you as my Savior. Why do I have this health issue? Why do I have this marriage issue? Why do I have this financial issue? Why don't you just make everything easy for me, God? God says, that's not my plan for you. One of the most dramatic statements, I think, and I've used it many times in different messages, is, when Jesus had told Peter, you're going to die for me. Now, how would you like to be initiated into God's work that way? And Peter turns, and what does Peter do? What about him? <laughs> what, what about John? Don't worry about John. <laughs> you worry about yourself. Okay. <laughs> so let me get this straight. I'm one of your key apostles, but I'm going to die yeah, Peter, you're going to die for me. What do you say to that? 
Can you imagine church membership? All right, after the three weeks church membership class, you come on in. All right, just to let you know, you need to give blood, you need to give all your money, and you're going to die. Just, just so you know. You still want to be a church member? Now, we don't do that, but think about that. That's pretty amazing. And here we go back to King David, who, whether he's running from King Saul this time or he's running from his own son at this time, who was trying to take over his kingdom. He's in a wilderness. He's in a mess either way. And what we notice about David, he made a passionate appeal to God. Again, verses 1 and 2, notice it was personal. O oh God, thou art what? My God. I don't want to underestimate what he's saying, that this cry out, because we have people, many people today will say, oh God, or they'll go, OMG, oh my God. You know, it's, it's a statement now we say when we, something good happens or bad happens or whatever. But here, David very clearly is saying, oh God, oh my God. It was a very personal meaning to him that he was calling out to his God. He was crying out to his God and making a passionate and a personal appeal. David's confession that he was loyal to only the one true God. That's what he's saying here. Oh God, thou art my God. I am yours. You are mine. There is no other God but you. This is his passionate, personal appeal to his God. Not only that, but it was persistent. Notice what it says here in verse number uh, one again. Oh God, thou art my God. Early will I what? Seek thee. Now, it's interesting that God has several verses in the Scripture that talk about seeking him diligently for an answer. Matthew chapter 7 comes to mind. What does it say? What does it say? Seeking. See, no, 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 seeking first. Remember, ask, seek, knock. It's a progression. If you don't get an answer from God by asking, then you seek. Well, what is seeking? It's more intense more deliberate. If you don't get an answer by seeking, then you start knocking. That gets your attention, doesn't it? Sure it does. Anyone knock on your door at night? Whoa, who's at our house? Who's there? What's going on? God said, ask, seek, knock, and you will get the answers you're looking for. Now, it may not always be in the way that you want the answer, but it's that progression, asking, seeking, knocking. David says, listen, diligently will I seek you. I will get up early in the morning and seek you, God. I will seek your face. Hebrews chapter number 11 or verse number 6 talks about that, that we are diligently seeking after God. He will reward those who diligently seek him. And there's many other verses that I could go to that would help you understand that God wants us to be deliberate. Now, what does it mean when, when we ask God for something, but then we just go on our life and we forget about it. What does that mean about us? We really weren't interested, were we? Come on, parents, you have kids? When they want something, what do they do? Oh, they ask and they ask and they ask and they ask. Even after you reprimand and stop asking. Okay, but mom, if it's not right then, it's the next day. It's, when they want something, they keep asking either till. You give them the what for, or they get the what not, okay? You just, they're going to keep at Why? Because it's something that they want, and even in their little minds, that's all they can think about. And God says, if this means something to you, then you diligently seek me for it. You keep asking. He'll give you the no sometimes, or he'll give you the answer, the yes. But you were to diligently seek him. David understood that, so he was passionate about his appeal to God. It was personal. Thou art my God. It was persistent. He diligently sought after God. He desires to commune with him. My soul thirsts for you like my body thirsts for water in a dry place. That's what David was saying. God, I want you more than I want anything else. And I can be honest with you, that's not always true in my life. God, right now, I want this. God, I, right now, I want this. God, right now, I love this more than I love you. So you shouldn't say that. You're a pastor. Okay, but I'm human. Just being real. There's times where God is not at the forefront of my mind. That's shame on me. Don't make me your excuse, though. You will answer to God for yourself. And we are to fervently seek to know our God and to understand Him and to grow and to wake up early, stay up late if it need be, but find a time that's precious to you so you can talk with your God and you can worship Him. 
We see that he had a passionate and personal appeal, persistent appeal. Then I put in here he had a pining appeal. Pining means longing. And notice what it says in verse number uh, verse number one, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, verse two, to see thy power in thy glory, so I, as I have seen in the, in the sanctuary, because of thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. We understand that the, he had a longing for God to see him as he saw him in the sanctuary. The sanctuary this time wasn't the temple. It was a place where they put the Ark of the Covenant that represented God's presence and His power with them, the people of Israel. David had to flee that. Now he's out in the wilderness in a dry and thirsty place and he longs to be back close to the place where the Ark was because that represented the presence of God, even though the presence of God could be with him where he was. He longed to be back where he knew God's presence would come. And we have to understand that his pining or his longing, he desired to sense God's presence as he did back in Jerusalem. The wilderness is a good place, though, to learn to wait on God. And David was learning the patience of waiting on God to answer his prayers. So first of all, we have his passion appeal. It was personal, it was persistent, it was a pining, it was a longing for God. And I could ask you this question. Amid all of the entertainment, amid all of the fun in your life, amid all the family members, the job, the career, whatever it is, do you actually long for God in your life? And sometimes you say, yes, passionately. And other times you can say, no, not really. I'm good. I had a good day. Didn't include God in it much. We need to get to the place where we say, I long for God every morning when I wake up. You know when that starts, though? The night before. See, most of us are just creatures of habit. We're just in the cyclical motion of just going through the same old thing, same old thing, same old thing. We never really think about what's going to happen next. If Saturday night, last night, you said, okay, church is tomorrow. We're going there to worship our God. We're going there to serve our God, use our gifts and talents for the Lord, pray as a family or pray by yourself and say, okay, I'm excited about tomorrow morning. Get everything ready, laid out. How different would your service to God on Sundays be if you thought about it, planned it out? Not just, oh yeah, we know we're going tomorrow. No, thought about it, planned it out, prepared yourself, prayed about the next day, prayed about the message would be taught from all the Sunday school teachers, all the workers, the pastors, just thought it through. The worship, how different would worship be on Sunday morning if we all came prepared for church? How different would your own devotions be if you planned it out? Hey, husbands, how different would your relationship with your wife be if you planned out some things thinking about her and her needs, or a wife thinking about him and his needs, parents thinking about the children and their needs, children thinking about the parents and their needs? How different would it be if we thought things through? But most of us just kind of go through the motions. And we get stuck in a rut, and before we know it, we're in the wilderness. How did I get here? Well, there were a lot of steps that got you to that place. You kind of just went on cruise control. You just kind of went through the motions. And so we have that. We need to have that longing as David had that longing. But where did David have that longing? He had the longing when he was in the wilderness. His longing came when he was in the wilderness away from the presence of God in the the tabernacle and the place where they stored the the Ark of the Covenant. When we get out in the wilderness, there should be a natural desire to get close to God. Secondly, a proactive praise. Verses 3 through 8, a proactive praise. Not only a passion appeal, but a proactive praise. Notice in verse number 3. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. Now think about that statement. My lips shall praise thee. Because I know, God, that your loving kindness. Well, what is loving kindness? Well, it has the word kindness in it. It has the word loving in it. It's talking about the gracious goodness of our God towards us, his favor towards us. David said, God, I know you are gracious towards me. I know you have a compassion on me. You are kind towards me. You are good towards me. And because I know that, even though I'm out in the wilderness and I'm running for my life, now most of us at that point don't think God is good. We think, what's wrong with you, God? I'm your servant. I'm one of your children. Why do I fear? Why do I have to run away from my own son? Why do I have to run away from my own position as king? David said, God, I know you. I know your character. 
Some of you go through things, death of a, a loved one or maybe a, a health issue, maybe a long-term health issue, maybe a marital issue, maybe a financial, whatever your issue might be. At those times, it's easy for us to get negative on God. David got positive on God. <laughs> David got to the point where he said in the wilderness, God, I know your character. I know you love me. I know you keep every tear that I cry. God, I am coming to praise you. He didn't wait till church on Sunday. He did it immediately. He found time during the day. He found time Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday to find time to praise his God with his lips. He didn't need a music director. He didn't need a choir director. He didn't need somebody to say, all right, folks, now we're going to sing this song to our God. No, it was from his heart. He just poured his heart out to God and said, God, I love you for loving me. He was proactive in his praise. This was based on the character of God, loving kindness. It was also he, had a cho he chose to worship or a choice to worship. David made a choice to praise God even though his situation was desperate. He focused on the character of God rather than on the character of men. Oh, there was a lot to poke holes at. My son who's after me. Your other king, God, who's trying to kill me. I mean, he could have pointed the finger to all kinds of people, all these murderers, all these naysayers, all these people who hate my life. Read the other Psalms. David lays it all out there, these wicked judges. There was a lot he could be pointing at, and that's what we do. That's what Peter did. Well, what about him? That's not fair. God, God's not in the area of uh, worrying about your fairness. He's working something in your life that may be different than my life. But he wants you to accept it, he wants you to embrace it, he wants you to learn from it, and then teach others to help others to grow in their spiritual life, perhaps. So a choice of worship. He chose to worship God even though he was going through a painful time in his life. And he says about his God, thy loving kindness is better than life. Life itself stinks compared to your character, God. God. My lips shall praise thee. It's funny sometimes, and I've been up here at times, we're trying to lead songs, and you got some people, they're just singing it out. And I love people with facial expressions. Sometimes I have to, you know, wonder. I've had, we've had music directors who lead songs that are, right, everyone smile when you sing the song. That's hard. It's hard to smile. But there's some people that do it, and they're great at it, they look good, and they, and they sing good. And the same. I think my face looks contorted when I try to smile and say, I don't know, I just... I try, I'll sing loud, I'm off key, but I'll sing loud and I'll, I'll sing praise to my God. But you have to understand that here we, we know that we are to sing and we are to worship our God. Remember, all these things were songs that they sung after they were written. That's why they're psalms, they were songs. And they expressed man's concern, they expressed truths about our God. And so we notice here is that David was willing to let his lips praise God the Lord. Verse number four, thus will I bless thee while I live. You ever thought about that? When you come to church on Sunday morning, that's just one time. You should be worshiping God every single day on your own. Every single day. I love singing by myself in my car alone with the windows rolled up. <laughs> and I think I sound really good in my car with the windows rolled up. I'm looking forward to my perfect voice when I get to heaven. I'll make you all listen as I sing a solo when we get to heaven. But I just sing out to God. And I, once I get going, man, I can just think of song after song after song, and I'll just sing, sing songs to my God. I don't need the radio on. I don't listen to the radio much at all. I just, it's whatever song we sang at church or another songs I've known for the years. And I just, my songs are songs saying, God, I appreciate you. I love you. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you for who you are. That's the kind of songs I like to sing to my God. I put that in part of my devotions. You know, I'll sing a, a little chorus, a little song to my God. Just let him know I love you. And I'm sure he's up there looking down at me as, you know, the big guy I am. He's my daddy. He's my father. He's probably saying, cute little Johnny. There he is singing again. <laughs> Just like our little kids. Twinkle, twinkle, widow star. How I, he's like, oh, look at John. He's trying. Hey, angels, get a load of this. He's trying again. <laughs> He's trying, Lord, can you just give him the gift, please? You know, give him, give him that. 
No, 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 this is cute. You guys need to understand. This is, this is cute. You don't think God has a sense of humor? Sure he does. I will bless thee. When's the last time you thought about you blessing God? Instead of, okay, God, I've done this for you. Where's my blessing? He doesn't work that way. He just doesn't. Now, he'll bless you for being his child like we do for our own children. But if you're doing things so God will bless you, that's not how he works. You bless him because you're his child. You bless him because you love him. And if he gives you something in return, amen. Thank him for it. But he may not always give you something in return. There's something about just being good and doing right and honoring your God. We have eternal life to look forward to. We're going to be there for all heaven, for all of eternity, in heaven. What a blessing. What else do I need in this earth? Work hard. Be diligent. Be faithful. When we get to heaven, it's going to be better. But I think sometimes we're looking for God to come along as almost like a sugar daddy and give us every gift that there is under the sun. And he's like, that's not how it works, people. That's not how it works. I will lift up my hands. That was a sign of dependence or adoration. I lift up my hands to my God once in a while. We'll, we'll, we'll see it here in church. Somebody will raise their hand. You know, depending on what type of church, you know, you've got a uh, conservative church, you've got churches that don't make any gestures at all, but then you go to maybe Pentecostal churches, charismatic churches. I've been to all of them, man. And some of the churches have downright, they have a blast in their services. I mean, you've got the window washers, you know, you're going, they're <laughs> lifting their hands. You've got the Baptocostals, and they're doing this with a woohoo, yeah, man, you know, they're you got all kinds, and some of that would freak you guys right out. Some of it, you're like, man, we need more of that. It's just different styles, different places, whatnot. But the idea of lifting up your hands was a, was a sign of adoration, a sign of praising their God. It was just, thank you, Lord. We do it here sometimes. Some of you, some of you will give a testimony. Some of you will raise your hand. Amen. Praise the Lord. You do it at ball games. Somebody scores a, a run. You're like, Woo! You just praise the guy who scored the run. You know, we, we do it in different ways. And uh, we understand that David had talked about lifting up his hands in thy name. And he looked for his soul to be satisfied. Verse number five, my soul shall be satisfied. This goes along with the title of the message. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. Let's talk about the, the good parts of the meat that you would eat to sustain you. And my soul shall be satisfied. Remember, he was in a desert place with a, a tall glass of water. My soul shall be satisfied. He's using this physically, but he's also talking spiritually. God, you will satisfy as I praise you, as I try to bless you. My soul shall be satisfied. He chose to worship God even in the affliction of his time. And he will praise with joyful lips. The reason he can rejoice is due to his, medica uh, his meditation, not his medication. His, <laughs> some of you do that. His meditation on God's promises. Oh, man. That would be good. I was church today. It was great. <laughs> I took my uppers right before the service, and man, that was the best funeral I've ever been to in my life. Sorry. Verse 6, when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. Now, how many of you have gone to bed at, say, 11 o'clock? I think 11, 12 o'clock is normal for us. And, and then at 2 o'clock you wake up. Isn't that the most rotten feeling? And, and you don't wake up. You wake up and you're not tired wake up. And you're like, ugh. And you can pray through everybody you can think about. Like, and you're hoping that during this prayer, God will just you know, give you the, the little doze off and you'll go back to sleep. And that doesn't happen. You're like, okay, I prayed through the list. What else do I need to do? And you're thinking through everything and, and you're just awake. David says it was those night watches, those long hours of prayer on my bed at night. Couldn't sleep, just talking to God. God, I know you're doing something in my life. What is it? Could you give me some direction here, God? I don't know, I don't understand everything you're trying to do in my life, but Lord, I want to understand it. Not, Lord, how could you do this to me? Lord, why would you do this? Get out of the pity party. God, what are you trying to teach me so I can learn it? The faster we get to the learning part, the easier maybe it'll get for us. Not that he'll alleviate every pain, but you'll start understanding and now start working on 
a solution. But David said the night watches were the times where he meditated and he focused on God. And this was his way of choosing to worship God. And he was being satisfied as he would do so. Verse number 7 says, God has already been his helper. In verse number 7, notice what it says. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. The shadow. Of the, he uses this as an illustration that as a mother hen would brood over her own little chicks, her own little offspring, and she would have them come in and nestle in under her, protect them. He said, God, that's how you have helped me in the past. And he remembers how God has helped him. He remembers how the Lord has protected him and been there for him. And even though he's had to suffer, he remembers the, the feelings of joy and elation when God would deliver him finally from something. And the waiting on God. And the, all this is training. All this is the process of him training and understanding the grace of his God, the love of his God, and the compassion of his God. And just think about this. God was preparing David to be a king over a nation. This is what we don't like. What is God preparing you for? Well, I'm not going to be a king. Hey, Dad, you're a pretty important illustration to your kids. Mom, you're like one of the most important illustrations to your kids. Ministry leaders, huge influence on people. You say, well, I'm, no, I'm just a pusher. No, you're an illustration. You're an influence to somebody. And God may put you through things to help temper you so that you then can be a good example and a good teacher, not of yourself, of his principles in your life. David was being seasoned through trials, seasoned through trials, and God was preparing him to be the right kind of king. Now, did he make his mistakes? Oh, yeah. Did he pay for them? Oh, yeah. But David, when he would recognize his sin, he'd get his heart right. There was nobody like him. Compassionate, loving, caring, someone who wanted God's best, not his own best for his people. Last point, we'll be done, is personal real realization. It's personal realization. Verses 9 through 11 his personal realization of God's plan must be trusted. David was already anointed king to be over Israel many years prior to this event. When David had the opportunity to kill King Saul, he did not do so because he was allowing God to, do, to be in charge of that situation. Now think about this. There was a time, if you go back and read some of these other chapters, you'll see that David had the opportunity to kill King Saul who was trying to kill him. In one respect, you'd have people in the nation of Israel say, well, that was fair. King Saul tried to kill David. David's anointed king. He killed Saul. All right, let's move on with life. Well, David said, no, I would not raise my hand against God's anointed. If God's going to take him out, I'll let God take him out. Now, David could have said, well, God delivered him in my hand. Here, I'll take opportunity. Take, take advantage of this opportunity. Listen to a very important statement. When you're in pain or when you're suffering or when you're going through a very difficult time, Opportunities may arise for you to get out of that pain, to get out of that trouble, to get out of that situation, but you better be very careful before you make that decision. David could have ended his turmoil like that by taking Saul's life. And he said, nope, I'm going to let God deal with him. That's a very important principle from, from David and Saul's relationship. We must understand that God is much better at working things out Say, yeah, but David had to suffer longer. Oh, yeah, he did. He had to suffer longer, but he was willing to let God be in charge and not take the advantage for himself. And sometimes we get in a spot financially, we get in a spot uh, with our marriage, we get, and we try to figure all these details out. We take advantage of what's good for me right now, and you didn't wait on God, or you didn't seek godly advice, and you... You, somebody tried to give you good advice, and you're like, nope, that's gonna, I'm not going to go this long and wait this long and do this. Listen, don't just look for the easy out opportunity. Trust God, even when it's in your ability to change something. Make sure it's God leading you. I think David's a great illustration of that. David demonstrated great restraint and trust in his God by not doing something that everyone else may have justified. 
Even though it prolonged David's pain, he wanted to honor God and wait on God's timing, not his own. Now notice verse number 10 and 11. David says, God's judgment will come. God's judgment will come on those who are coming after me. Verse number 9, he says, But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lowest parts of the earth. He's saying they're going to the grave. Those who are after me because of my following God, because of doing right, he says, I know their end. They're going to hell. They're going to the grave. Secondly, I notice what he says here. God's judgment will come. Verse number 10, they shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for the foxes. Think about that. Those enemies, my, the enemy armies that are coming after me, God's going to have them be killed, and the dog, the wild dog, is going to eat their flesh. This is pretty graphic. But David knew that God was on his side. He just had to wait for God to deliver him. He didn't know how long that was going to be, but he was willing to wait on God to deliver him. And he knew the end of those who were turning against him. And then finally, in verse number 11, it says, But the king shall rejoice in God. What king? Him. He will rejoice in God. When God brings the deliverance, I look forward to the day that I can rejoice. Some of you won't be able to rejoice in certain things in your life until you're in heaven you have a new body. But some will be able to rejoice in this lifetime and we're called to rejoice with them. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory, but the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. Now think about this. The Psalms are songs. How would you put verses 9 and 10 and 11 into a song? <laughs> but that's what they did. They would sing this. And the end result that David left off was that those who are wicked, those who are against him because they were against God, would suffer. They would die. The dogs would eat their flesh. They would go to the grave. Some would go to hell because they weren't true believers. And this was put to song. And so we notice from Psalm 63 that David had a passionate appeal, a proactive praise, and a personal realization that God's plan must be trusted. I don't know where you are in your wilderness, if you are there, or you, maybe you're coming out of one, maybe you're going into one. But are you in a dry and thirsty place in your life? Take some good advice from a man familiar with dwelling in the desert. Meditate on God's promises. Remember your salvation experience. Follow hard after God. Don't flee to sinful desires for temporary satisfaction. Allow yourself to experience the joy that comes with waiting on God with a pure heart. He will in time refresh your soul if you'll trust him.